and or good afternoon. Welcome and thank you for participating in the second webinar of our Geothermal Innovations for East Africa series. Please note this webinar is being recorded and all participants are muted with their video turned off. My name is Derek Burke. I'm a senior program coordinator at the United States Energy Association. I work on the US East Africa Geothermal Partnership. To give a brief background on USEA, we are a nonprofit membership association of public and private energy related organizations corporations, and government agencies. USEA represents the broad interests of the U.S. energy sector by increasing the understanding of energy issues, both domestically and internationally, through capacity building activities and events like this one. If you'd like to learn more about USEA and our work, I welcome you to go to our website, www.usea.org. We would like to thank our members and partners for their support in the energy sector during this difficult time. Each of us has felt the effects of the global pandemic, and we continue to work together to recover and come out stronger at the end. Now, I would like to hand off to Meseret at the United Nations Environment Program in Nairobi for a brief introduction about her program and further description of today's topic. Meseret. Thank you very much, uh, Derek, uh, for the brief introduction. Uh, I uh, say good morning, uh, good afternoon, uh, good evening. Uh, to all distinguished participants from wherever you are. Uh, my name is Mesret Taklamariam Zamedko. I work for the United Nations Environment Program as head of uh, energy unit in the regional office uh, for Africa. So all uh, with my team, our greetings from here, Nairobi, Kenya, where we have the main seat of our headquarter of the United Nations Environment Program. So on behalf of my organizations and on my own behalf, I'm delighted to welcome you all to this important webinar on the, that focuses on the geothermal database management. And we thank you all for joining us in this difficult moment. And again, uh, uh, we really thank the United States uh, Energy Association, uh, actually uh, the East African Geothermal uh, program for uh, really uh, joining its forces, you know, to organize this webinar. Uh, when we say that, you know, uh, UNEP, why organizing this database uh, management is UNEP through its uh, regional program of the African Reefs Geothermal Development Facility Program is really supporting the all uh, RGO member countries in the East Africa region particularly in catalyzing investment uh, through mitigation of the geothermal resource exploration. This is mostly included by uh, giving advice on uh, policy and also providing a technical assistance, particularly in uh, surface exploration studies to identify the resource and also target sites for uh, just deep drilling. And also we develop actually the capacity and the skill of home grown experts here in geothermal science and technology. And also we get involved in regional systems and actually networking and information systems. So this is basically including through this experience, we develop a different kinds of data through this exploration and also actually in every aspects. So as you see, one of the important uh, tools in de-risking investment is having a clear, coherent, and integrated geothermal, actually, uh, relational database system. So it is against this backdrop that UNEP joined its forces with East African Geothermal Program of the United States Environment uh, Energy Association to organize such kind of important, uh, you know, webinar, because uh, actually, you know, this data generated actually from this whole exploration, actually the geoscientific data, geology, geochemistry, geophysics, hydrogeology, and others, and also during drilling, both exploratory and appraisal drillings and production drillings, and also during the well testing reservoir engineering management, all these data really requires a huge investment, actually millions of dollars. So this really requires a very good, careful management, collecting, integrating and processing data and putting 
it in a very good archive. This is actually why the UNEP is playing a role in this is because this is the one that really contributes to sustainable development of the geothermal systems and in turn contributes to the socioeconomic development of the continent. To this end, uh, today we have two distinguished experts, uh, senior experts from the USA Tetra Tech and actually uh, Mr. Robert Kennedy is a senior systems engineer and geothermal data technical expert. And Mr. Jeffrey Benegar is a hydrogeologist and also a director for geothermal services. Both are from US Tetra Tech. And they are really bringing their huge and vast experience in database management, both in developed and developing countries. And they will share with us its significant contribution to attract investment and using different various tools of GIS and also remote sensing. And kindly uh, join me in welcoming these two distinguished experts. And I welcome first Mr. Jeff Benger, just to give us the introduction. So uh, while he is uh, coming, I just let you know that uh, please, during the presentation, kindly type your questions in the chat box because these two experts are bringing and just presenting their uh, you know, uh, experiences and also all the informations alternatively and we will have a series of their uh, presentation and then the question and answers will be at the end of their presentation. Thank you very much and I give the floor to Mr. Jeff. Welcome. Thank you, Meseret, and uh, thank you all for attending. Um, I'll start the um, webinar right now. Bear with me for one minute. Um, not sure why it's not sharing now. Um, a little technical issue here. It was. Um, I want to start sharing the presentation. Um, uh -huh. Ryan, is, can you make Jeff the host now so he can present? For some reason, yes. the uh, so let me let me just remove him and bring him back again. Um, he is at the moment. I see that you are the host right now. No, presenter. You know, there's a difference. Um, okay. Jeff, you okay? I can see that. Yeah, we can see it. Great. We can, we, yeah, we can see your presentation now. Okay. Thank you. And sorry for that little glitch. Um, so this webinar is on geothermal data management. Um, I am Jeffrey Benegar. Um, I'm a hydrogeologist and the director of geothermal services for Petrotech. So I've been working in this industry for more than 30 years on both geothermal and other geoscience projects. And these, these projects almost always generate significant amounts of data. Um, so I can say I've learned the hard way about the importance of proper data management. In order to make informed decisions with respect to the work I do, in term, uh, which is working on subsurface characterization and resource and reservoir interpretation and assessment. Um, let me turn it over to my colleague, Rob, Robert Kennedy, for a minute so he can introduce himself and then we'll continue with the presentation. Uh, go ahead, Robert. Robert, you're muted. You okay, that's it. I can unmute myself. Good. Abare um, Chana and Mden uh, Wallace, Mden Wallakum. It's nice to be here. Um, I'm Robert Kennedy. I'm a systems engineer. That means. Uh, engineer who looks at um, uh, mechanical, electrical, uh, other systems and how they all work together. 
I've been doing green energy for indigenous peoples for over a decade all over the world. Um, I have a background in robotics and AI um, originally. So I bring that um, knowledge base um, to our work these days and today. It's nice to be here. Thanks, Robert. So in, um, in case there's any technical difficulties um, or if you have to leave the presentation early, I, I just want to let everyone know uh, that I want to provide you now the most important idea from this presentation. And that is that a properly designed and built relational database uh, management system is considered the best practice for handling geothermal data. So if that's the one takeaway you get from this webinar, I, I hope that's it. Uh, the agenda for our webinar is shown here. We anticipate 45 minutes to go through this material. And at the end, as, as Derek said, we'll have a question and answer period. So the purpose of this webinar is to present a general high level review of data management and databases and their importance with respect to geothermal uh, development projects. So let's start at the beginning and ask, you know, why is data management important when it comes to geothermal projects? Well, geothermal exploration, as we all know, consists of acknowledged high risk activities that generate lots of data. Now, the highest financial risk of a geothermal project occurs during the drilling of the first well, when the uh, uncertainty of the resource is still quite high. Now, while drilling provides information that significantly reduces the uncertainty of a geothermal resource, it does so at high upfront costs and risks. As we know, drilling is usually the most expensive activity and can cost you know, millions of dollars. So this is a high risk barrier that frequently is the biz biggest obstacle on a geothermal project. So good data management helps reduce, reduce the risky nature of geothermal projects to minimal levels with good data that informs decisions at every stage of the project. Now, another reason for data management and its importance is that in many countries, including mature um, jurisdictions like the United States, data may be spread out and disconnected. For example, data may be located across different departments or ministries or here in the United States within different, different states within the United States. So this can lead to miscommunication, wasted resources, duplicated efforts, and failure among team members to make meaningful insights such as building a proper conceptual model of a geothermal resource. In their 2013 best practices document, the World Bank states that exploration risk is best mitigated by experienced data interpretation. So the use of a data management system is one tool that can help uh, improve data collection, analysis, and interpretation. Now, let me hand over the presentation to Robert for this next series of slides in which we'll discuss databases, their pros and cons, and the advantage of using a relational database system compared to other methods. So, what is a database? Well, it's a collection of data, but um, it's not merely a heap of data such as this library on the lower right, um, it's organized data. Um, databases began um, at the turn of the last century, uh, 120, 130 years ago, when countries, um, beginning with the United States, first started taking census data and putting um, citizens' name and address and age of uh, vital statistics on punched cards. And in order to, this is when uh, computer processing early, this is even pre computer processing, just with punch card sorting, um, it's the beginning of uh, IBM, was managing census data. And before you can have a heap, when you have a heap of census data, you must impose a structure if you're going to be able to drill down, no pun intended, to any particular um, data. So the key for data, it's not a heap of data, it's organized, database is organized. 
and it has a purpose. 120 years ago, the purpose was for uh, a country to know how many citizens it had and where they lived and their ages and vital statistics. Um, there are many other purposes for data. There are financial databases, um, engineering databases. In our case, we want to know where to drill and I'll show you that in a little bit because we want to know where to drill correctly. One can never know that exam example or answer exactly until one has done it. And as Jeff said, the upfront risk of doing that, it's millions of dollars to find out the answer to that. It's millions of dollars to drill a well. And you might spend the millions and uh, discover you have a dry hole and that you missed the resource because no one has x-ray vision and could see underground. So what we do is collect data above ground about as many different things, integrate that data into a holistic whole and make our guess best guess possible. It's not perfect, but that's how you minimize the risk. So in the modern era, this is done not with punched cards or file drawers full of paper, but uh, digitally um, on a, a computer with storage and a piece of software and application called a database management system. And in particular, a relational database. Now, one might say, well, I have, I have Excel you know, a flat sheet, uh, columns, rows, that's a database. Um, you could call it a database. It's what we call a flat file. Um, the good things about Excel is virtually everybody in the world with a computer knows how to use Excel. It's widely available, uh, either Excel or some other spreadsheet program um, in any basic office suite. It's easy to learn and use. You don't have to take formal classes and you can do work on the Excel um, on your own time without being connected to a central system. Uh, the disadvantage of working in this manner is number one, um, the ownership of the data. So someone can be working offline in Excel but if their management doesn't know it, or if the person loses their file, has a technical problem, then all that work is lost. Also, when data is spread out all over the place in spreadsheets on individual computers, if any of that data is confidential or sensitive, um, it's impossible to secure the data to protect it when it's distributed out among a large number of users and computers. Um, a spreadsheet, because it's on one computer being used by one person, it's obviously only one person is, you, is touching that data at any particular time. And if a different person has a copy of the same spreadsheet and is working on it, then how do they coordinate? How does one say, well, I worked on this column and changed this cell. What did you do? Um, the coordination actually grows as the square, n squared, of the number of people working on it, which is something we'll illustrate with a simple role play. And then there's the version control. So when you finished your work, do you email it back to the boss or do you put it up um, in a central server where people know where to get it and how do you coordinate the different versions being worked on by different people email them around to each other that's not very efficient so the advantage of a proper database is what's called data integrity that's where a datum in the database is trusted. It didn't get in there until the person in charge 
of that field of knowledge looked at that datum and said, yes, this is good data. It goes into the database and there's only one piece of that particular information. It's unique. It's not copied all over the place. It's just in one place. With a database, you can have sysadmins who exercise control who can see the data and security and you manage security with appropriate permissions, either read only such as a member of the public or edit permissions, a member of the team or even higher permissions, um, creating files and deleting files by the sysadmin. A major benefit of a real database is multiple people can work on the same data set at the same time. And the value of this cannot be overstated. Um, it, it gets over that coordination problem. Um, you can have a vast pile of organized data, yet for a particular team, only one slice of that data is visible that they can work with, and the other data they don't touch. Every field, every class of data can be secured with permissions. And finally, with a proper database program, the program can run diagnostics on itself, um, keep track of who's doing what, how many hours are being spent, how big the database is. Now, the downsides of a proper database program is if you're offline, if you're disconnected from the central server, well, then you obviously you can't touch the data at all. You can't work on it. Um, the programs, the applications to work with and modify that data, they're pretty specific. They're not as common as Excel and they require training, sometimes lots of training. So the learning curve to use a proper database can be pretty high in, in order, say, Excel is a flat file and then Microsoft Access, that's a primitive but powerful database tool, and then more sophisticated database programs, such as uh, ones that use structured query languages, such as SQL. Now, to learn these requires a, an investment in time in your people, but investing in people is always a good idea because it's an investment in yourself. That's what my colleague and I do all over the world is building human capacity. So let me show you an example of why a spreadsheet is not as good as a proper database. So um, Mr. A gives a copy of the spreadsheet to Ms. B. Now, while Ms. B is off doing her thing with the spreadsheet, Mr. A is doing some things also. Ms. B eventually starts working on her spreadsheet. Ms. B then gives the one she worked on to her teammate, Mr. C. Mr. C makes some copies. B, Ms. B gives her copy to Mr. A. Mr. A then goes and makes a presentation. What is not here? What's missing? The answer is Mr. C's work because it didn't get back. Mr. C's work was working in isolation after Ms. B gave the spreadsheet to him. So his work was not reflected in the product that Mr. A presented. The way you fix that is with a database tool that everyone is logged into a common, data, common database and no one's work is lost. So here, uh, another example. So Mr. A downloads from the central server um, a local copy. 
later that morning, Ms. B makes changes on the central server. <clears throat> Mr. A makes his changes on his local copy. Mr. A then saves those changes back on the central server. What's missing? Well, Mr. A and Mr. B, the, uh, the um, Excel, their work is not coordinated because Mr. A was working on a local copy Ms. B was unaware of. So when Mr. A uploaded his version, it wiped out her work. It overwrote it. How do you avoid it? You do, you avoid this problem with a proper database tool. Now I've been using an example of Mr. A and Mr. Ms. B. That's just two people. And you can see with just two people, you can have a coordination problem. So, Mr., one node, Ms., another node. So, one, two nodes, one link. Add just one more person to the equation. So, we increase the number of nodes in this simple network by 50%. But look, now we have three links where before, three possible links where before we only had one. The number of links, even though the number of nodes increased by 50%, the number of links increased by 200%. If we go another simple network of just four people, the number of links, possible links, between each node is, is now six, okay? Around the square and then cross in the X. This is a general problem in computer science and in systems engineering called Metcalfe's Law. And it illustrates with more independent users, with more nodes, the coordination problem grows as N squared and in fact becomes uncontrollable. Now in this, that's why, that's why you need a proper database management system. Now a problem unique to the geothermal field is the extraordinary diversity and variety and heterogeneity of geothermal data. Um, you have papers, reports, and maps that you either get from libraries or online, uh, physical libraries or online libraries. Uh, physiography and geomorphology, in other words, uh, maps, terrain elevations, etc. You have the three geosciences, geology, geochemistry, and geophysics. You have the explosion in the world of imagery um, and GIS. Uh, geodesy, ge geomatics, multiple coordination systems used world in different parts of the world, um, numerous overhead imaging products. You have the data that's generated by the drilling, by your driller, by the drilling industry. Um, and the drilling can be for water, oil and gas, or geothermal. In fact, the um, data you get from uh, water drilling and uh, oil and gas also could be of great interest to a geothermal enterprise. And finally, if you're doing work with the World Bank, there's socioeconomic data. Um, the World Bank requires um, that impact studies be done uh, on projects it's involved in to be sure the product uh, project is benefits the community. So you do environmental studies, ecological studies, cultural um, and um, socioeconomic impact studies. So in the database, you'll have keywords that occur from 
all of these possible sources. Uh, big paper maps in a roll. Um, piles of magazines, um, specialized conference proceedings, uh, desktop studies that you might have access to. The oil and gas industry has an enormous amount of data. There are millions of oil and gas wells around the world, and every one of them, whether it was a long time ago or today, generates quite a bit of data called the drilling log. And the problem with the private sector data, um, especially if it's old, is it's not machine readable. A, if a piece, if a report is sitting in a library on the shelf, un until you scan it in and do an OCR on, on <clears throat> those words, the database is not going to know of its existence. And the engineers and financiers making decision, the drilling decisions won't know about the existence of that report either. And a project um, that we are familiar with um, ran into this problem in East Africa, where a um, international aid agency drilled, drilled a geothermal well, and there was a paper report in a library, which had they only read it, they would have known not to drill in that location. It's not that the data didn't exist, it wasn't accessible. So how do you collect data? Um, you can just go out on the web and start reading and build a data, data set of yourself. You can join organizations like the International Geothermal Association or the Geothermal Resources Council, which have online libraries. Uh, you could work for private sector companies. They keep all their own data. If you're an academic, of course, there's loads of data in academia and libraries. Government ministries, some government ministries collect and disseminate their geothermal data quite well. Others do not. And then there's professional journals but it must be noted that the material in these journals is usually derivative, meaning it's generally not written, say, by the driller who did the work or the geothermal engineer who laid out the well, well field. Um, the society we belong to, the Geothermal Resource Council, um, um, publishes a monthly bulletin, but the bulletin is pretty much businesslike and soft. However, at the annual meeting, those papers are pretty hard science. So the database needs to link to all of these different physical um, manifestations. There's alteration zones when uh, travertine or a particular clay called zeolite exist. Um, you have to you have to record where they are. You do geochemistry on the nearby um, fluids. You're always looking for surface manifestations, be it faults or rifts or fumaroles, holes in the ground from steam or hot waters coming out of. Um, there could be libraries of samples. In, in Uganda, for example, um, next to the uh, mineral ministry is a building with just trays of rocks, samples from um, locations all over Uganda. You want heat maps and um, temperatures, uh, locations for all those heat sources so you can build a heat map and better build a heat map underground. Uh, the trouble with all of this data is it's unstructured. So it's a report here, it's a physical sample there. The data needs to be all in one place such that a multidisciplined person can look at all of the data from the different fields of knowledge and make a as correct a possible decision 
about where to drill because that's where all the risk is. So you can have um, cross sections, you can have uh, conceptual models, uh, which, which are a drawing of aquifers that might be underground with their estimated um, temperature distribution. You can collect physical measurements and those are recorded uh, temperature, uh, pH, uh, conductivity, total dissolved solids, dissolved gases, uh, the chemical species present, isotopic markers, um, isotopes of helium, for example, gas that's just coming out of the soil. These are all uh, what are called geothermometers, meaning their, their existence that you can collect on the surface tells you something about the temperature of what's underneath that you cannot see directly. So here in the lower right would be um, a, there's data that's generated by the geophysicists uh, doing flyover aerial magnetic surveys, uh, gravity surveys, putting small microphones on the ground, listening for very tiny um, earthquakes or active seismography where you you either hit the ground with large weights or in the oil and gas industry, sometimes they even set off small explosions, it goes bang, and then you look at all the wave, the reflected waves that come back. You also need to link all of these physical and chemical and geological phenomena that you're collecting, you need to link it to imagery that you can obtain from above ground or from outside. You can't see underground except in particular cases of seismic studies, um, seismology. Above ground, there's any number of constellations in space now that take panchromatic, which is all color, or hyperspectral um, beyond the colors that the human eye can see. They collect that data. You can fly around with little lasers and do um, develop terrain um, models, elevation. Um, fit those in with commercial GIS packages. You can set up differential different, uh, GPS receivers. Uh, all of this data is inherently georeferenced. That means the phenomena you measured is also in a specific XY location on Earth, latitude, longitude, or some other coordinate system. So something we experienced, again, not on our project, but we, it was near to us, we were aware of it, is um, with two different coordinate systems, ARC-60, which is common in Africa, um, it's a legacy G, um, coordinate system, and WGS-84, which is used by every cell phone in the world, um, there's, in this specific location, those two different coordinate systems, what was thought to be the same point uh, was actually 600 meters away from the real point. So the drilling took place at the wrong point. Had they been in the correct coordinate system, had the coordinate system that the data was taken in, had it been recorded as either WGS or R60 instead of just an a coordinate system assumed, that mistake would not have been made. On the left-hand side of your screen, you see an old drilling report. Um, some of these drilling reports are over 100 years old, but they contain data, data which could be valuable to a geothermal enterprise. So you need to be able to link to that kind of data. Um, drilling logs, and they don't have to be geothermal drilling operations. Uh, they could be water, public water, or drilling for oil and gas, but that all generates data which is of interest to a geothermal engineer. You can drill uh, 
thermal gradient holes, TGHs, or uh, which, which are about this big, say five centimeters, or slim holes, which are 10 centimeters, or full-size geothermal wells, which at depth are typically 20 centimeters, and on the surface, they can be over a meter in diameter. Uh, the trouble with all of these old records, they can be old, they weren't organized. A well that was drilled 100 years ago obviously isn't going to have anything about GPS in there. It's going to be some old coordinate system. It's inconsistent, not machine readable. Sometimes these reports are handwritten. So it's a problem. And we've already covered the um, kind of data that you need to be collecting and be aware of also if you're on a World Bank funded project. So you see that there's just the diversity of data is, is staggering. Um, a geothermal engineer needs to be almost an engineer of everything, conversant with geology, geochemistry, geophysics, the practicality of well drilling and some awareness of licensing. And so that um, is the segue to uh, my colleague Jeff, who will present um, a model of a geothermal relational database management system. Over to you, Jeff. Thank you, Robert. Um, so this next set of slides will discuss what a geothermal data system might look like and the key elements of such a system. Um, so as Robert uh, just discussed, a data management system will incorporate many different types of relevant data to be organized and connected. Pictured here is a general model for one such geothermal data management system. So at the top level is the data itself, primary data from field collection activities, as well as existing and legacy data. Each type of data would be under the jurisdiction of the data custodian. Now, this is a concept that we'll discuss in a little more detail on the next slide. But the data custodian is a subject matter expert who is responsible for all the data in that particular discipline. So in this example, the data management system consists of five databases, geoscientific data, as well as licensing data. Included in this data management system are links to spatial data. Now, as we discussed, you know, significant amount of geothermal data is inherently geographic and geospatial in nature. So these links to spatial data may be in a GIS or a cadastre portal. All the databases are managed using relational database software. Um, Robert discussed earlier, very simple software such as Microsoft Access or typically more advanced software. Now, well, what we want to do in this model uh, is also link uh, data to legacy libraries containing soft copy documents and reports. And Robert discussed that uh, previously, old reports, old maps that would be of interest. So this system would be usable for all the local users within an enterprise, such as a geologic survey, an electric power authority, or a licensing agency. This system would uh, most likely contain both confidential or proprietary data, as well as non-confidential or public domain data. The system would include a web-based interface for external users, such as concession holders, private industry, or the general public. External users would have specific privileges, such that confidential data remains confidential and could only be accessed by authorized users, such as the owners of the data. Non-confidential data could be accessible for all external users. Now, as we just talked about, the data custodian has a very key role as a member of the data management team. The data custodian is a subject matter expert, such as a geophysicist or a geologist or a drilling engineer, who is responsible for collecting, organizing, and storing all the data for that particular discipline in the database. 
So he or she would know the scope and extent of data, both primary, meaning actively collected data, as well as legacy data. They would be responsible for the quality of the data, meaning the accuracy and validity of the data, including cleaning of the data. And they'd be responsible for the long-term maintenance of the data in the database. Ideally, the data custodian should be at least a two-person team for redundancy. Uh, this is from a human resources perspective, as well as for quality assurance and quality control purposes. Now let's talk for a minute about um, business rules. So the design of any data management system should be based on business rules. So what are business rules? Well, they're simply the operating rules that govern any particular enterprise. For example, in some East African countries, uh, the establishment of a geothermal concession is based on the exploration license. So all geographic and geoscience data would flow from this primary element in the database. In this case, it would be the license. Now, in other jurisdictions, uh, based on how they are established and the rules that govern them, there may be different primary elements in their data management system. For example, in California, where geothermal regulations originally were based on the oil and gas industry, which predated geothermal development by decades, one of the primary elements in their data management system is the well. All other data would be linked to this element, the well. So one way is not better than the other. These examples are given just to show how any organization must decide internally how best to manage its data based upon the rules by which it operates. It's been our experience working in East Africa for these last uh, several years that licensing should at least be of co-equal importance to the geoscience disciplines in designing uh, the geothermal data management system. Now, as we've talked uh, already, um, and as we know, much most geothermal data is spatial in nature. So there is a geographic component to it. Usually this data is stored and used in software such as a GIS, a geographic information system, or a cadastre portal. It makes more sense to use this type of data in these types of softwares. However, a good data management system should allow for the linkage of spatial data with data tables and corresponding data records in the relational database. For example, the geochemistry results from a water sample taken at a well are best stored in a data table in the database, such as a results table, while the geographic elements of that well are best stored in a GIS. The various types of geospatial data that are typically stored in a, a GIS or cadaster are shown here. You know, one-dimensional data, a specific location, such as a well, uh, two-dimensional data, such as faults, liniments, or an area, perhaps the boundary of a concession. Or a licensed geothermal area, and then three-dimensional data, including you know, a volume, the geothermal reservoir, the geologic model of a reservoir would be in three dimensions and stored in a cadaster or GIS. So um, the slide here shows an example of GIS data linked to corresponding data elements in a relational database. Geospatial data that is best used and stored in a GIS, such as the X and Y coordinates, can be linked to non-spatial data associated with that particular location. And this, in this example, chemistry results from a water sample taken at a specific location. So this linkage is done via a unique identifier stored in both the GIS and the database. So this unique identifier links the GIS or cadaster to the relational database and eliminates the need for storing large amounts of duplicate data. Now, security is a very important consideration to take into account when uh, designing any relational database. A robust geothermal data management system must take into account security considerations. For example, most jurisdictions require the submissions of data from private concession holders or IPPs. This data is usually confidential and the owners of the data want to know that their data will remain secure when submitted to the appropriate regulatory authority. 
So the actual software used to build the geothermal database is driven first and foremost by these security concerns. The database needs to allow authorized users to be able to log in and access and use the data, but equally, it needs to prevent unauthorized access, uh, unauthorized use or deletion of data by users who are not supposed to have access privileges to that data. In addition, security is also important in preventing hackers, for example, from destroying data or disrupting service. So a good security plan should be in place at the beginning of the development process of the data management system and address these concerns throughout the life of the data management system. Now, these next set of slides, um, I'll turn it back over to Robert and give some examples of best practices from other jurisdictions, um, some examples of geothermal databases, and our concluding statement on uh, best practices for geothermal data management. So over to you, Robert. Thank you, Jeff. So here is an example of a web interface. So this is an interface that the public sees, but behind it is a geothermal database uh, operated by the state of California. Now, why are we focusing, why are we using California as an example? Um, uh, not because we happen to be Americans, but um, California, if California were its own country, it would have the United the United States has the largest geothermal industry on Earth. Um, Thirty three thousand three hundred meg uh, megawatts um, installed. California, the majority of that geothermal industry is in California. California has almost three thousand megawatts of geothermal capacity installed. So if California were its own country, um, it would be the largest geothermal country on earth. Also, California has historically been very advanced in the way government shares data with people and the citizens. So oil and gas activity in California 100 years ago was um, regulated by the state government and from the oil and gas industry grew the geothermal industry. So Californians developed a sensible brief um, set of regulations to regulate their geothermal industry. It's only 15 pages long. Um, one of those, one of the aspects of that regulation is that companies operating in the geothermal sector have to make reports to the state government. And the state government in turn makes those, makes that data available to the public, to other members of the industry, to regulators, to you know, all kinds of stakeholders. So here's an example of a, the front end the web-based front end of a uh, geothermal database management system that's on the back end, not visible to the user, but the results can be seen on the front. So we have a map, we have a terrain map. We can zoom in on any of these icons. And for instance, if you click one of these little green icons, um, what it is, it's a power plant. And if you click it, a pop-up window appears that tells you the name of the plant, who owns it, its power rating, uh, what type of plant, uh, how big it is, uh, and if, it's, if the plant is operating or being designed or in the approvals stage, whatever. So any member of the public or industry can see this. Same web interface okay from the california um, um, division of oil and gas and geothermal resources called dogger for short same database same web interface only now we're looking at a different layer of data 
yes, we still have the map, but now we have the geologic map. Uh, which rocks appear in which locations, the stratigraphy. So if you're a geologist, you would find this interesting. You will note in the central valley of California, all of these little black stars, these are oil and gas operations. Okay, so if you're a geothermal engineer and, and you know that the oil and gas sometimes develops information of interest to you, you go look at where these oil and gas wells are and you click on an individual well. Here is a database of all the wells in California. It's, there's many, many thousands of them. Each well has a unique um, identifier, a unique number. Um, you've got the name of the lease, which is um, in East African terms, it's the same as a license. It's a name for the lease area. Uh, the well, what type of well it is, um, its status, is it active, is it decommissioned, is it idle? Um, geographic information, uh, lat long, uh, township range. Notice also, if you click on any one of these well numbers, in some cases, you would pull up another modern database. But in other cases, if it's a very old well and you click on it, up comes this scanned document that relates to that well. This was prepared by the driller on behalf of an oil company, um, a subsidiary of an oil company. So Occidental Geothermal, uh, which is a subsidiary of Occidental Petroleum. And here you see they drilled a thermal gradient hole 41 years ago. So th this is before databases were on the web. So this is an old paper document. It tells you where it was drilled, the physical characteristics of the well, how deep it is, how what the diameter was, and basic uh, results. The construction diagram in here down at the bottom of this old paper report, you see that the hole was abandoned um, soon after drilling. So they drilled it, collected their data, um, abandoned it, wells no longer in use, and they filed a report about that. Now here, California's neighboring state, Nevada, which also has a um, significant geothermal industry. This is, in fact, the diagram called a schema of a database. So each one of these tables contains data. So for instance, notice uh, over the isotope table contains something called site ID. And notice that that site ID occurs in many other tables. <clears throat> now, this actually illustrates the advantage of working with a proper relational database management system. If you need to make an alteration, for instance, to the site ID variable, and if this were Excel, you would have to open up, what are we looking at here? Over a dozen spreadsheets, and you would have to change the site ID in each one of those spreadsheets. And if you missed, if you by mistake you missed one, it's gonna cause problems later because that table is out of sync with all the others. On the other hand, if you had a proper geothermal um, relational database management system, then the authorized user could log in, make changes to that one variable site ID, and they would 
that data is stored in one place and one place only. So when the authorized user makes a correct change to that variable, it propagates to all of the other tables that use that variable. And you can see every table is linked to other tables. So that this diagram here illustrates why database management systems are superior to spreadsheets. Okay. Even actually you could do this in Access. This is superior to Excel for the simple reason you only have to make one change and it propagates to all the other data sets that touch that one particular data. So it does away with the coordination problem. And now I'll turn it back to my colleague, Jeff. Thank you, Robert. So, I'd like to summarize now um, our webinar. And the main takeaway is that there's some commonalities that all mature um, geothermal jurisdictions share. Um, US, Iceland, New Zealand, countries where geothermal exploration and development has been ongoing for decades. And the number one best practice is that setting up a relational database is the best practice to securely manage um, your geothermal resources and your geothermal data. Um, principally, uh, setting up a relational database is the best practice to securely manage exploration data and risk. Other best practices, other commonalities that we see in mature geothermal jurisdictions include the fact that data uh, should be stored and is stored in digital format as much as practically as much as practically possible. Uh, data that's stored in geothermal databases typically consists of both raw data, uh, you know, native data collected in the field, processed data, and interpreted data. And the database provides long-term use and storage of that data. Equally. Most geothermal uh, jurisdictions in the world have data submission requirements and procedures um, that geothermal operators are required to submit certain types of data that they collect regularly. So these data submission procedures or standards are typically clearly defined as part of the regulatory framework and requirements. And those standards are then passed down and incorporated in the data management system. The use of existing commercial software on local servers of the cloud is the best practice in most geothermal jurisdictions. So this is software um, proprietary, which can be purchased, such as you know, Microsoft Access, Microsoft SQL Server, Oracle. These are typically the existing commercial software platforms that are used for data. And most uh, uh, geothermal jurisdictions have in place specific quality control procedures to ensure that data is accurate, that it's clean, and that it's complete. So with that, we conclude our presentation on geothermal data management practices, and we would now be happy to entertain any questions you may have. Thank you very much, uh, I think, Robert and Jeff for this uh, very comprehensive and with your vast experience sharing actually the nature, the type of data, particularly when you come to the geothermal exploration and development aspects, its heterogeneity and also diversified nature of the data in terms of the geothermal exploration and development value chain, starting from resource identification, its exploration, the different geoscientific studies, the geology, geochemistry, geophysics, hydrogeology, 
the drilling and reservoir engineering and others. And it is really good to uh, remind us uh, basically using the spreadsheet and how it really affects on its pros and cons, particularly uh, assuming that the spreadsheet is like a using or of a storing of data systems. Actually, it is very good to recognize that. And uh, I think, Jeff, you just uh, shared with us the custodian of this data, which is really very, very important. Who are the owners, the public, private, and others? And also the roles and missions of data custodians. That is very, very important. And the scope, extent, and the quality of data and the business rules. That is really what we should really keep in mind. Indeed, as a takeaway what you gave us, I think it is actually a universal agreement that the setting up of the database management system is really a best practice to secure the exploration data in the risk we are involved with, particularly when it comes to geothermal. So in this regard, uh, I think uh, there are a number of questions that uh, came from different uh, participants. While I'm just uh, giving you, I hope that it will come more in the chat box and we will just entertain that. Uh, the first question that I got is from Tabi Joda. And actually, Tabi is really concerned about not only the data, but actually his main concern is the contribution of geothermal as a driver to food and security. I hope that is being uh, will be addressed by you. So Toby is saying, how do we leverage geothermal knowledge or data, any information in improving agriculture and food systems, particularly in reducing food loss in Africa? And the second question that I have from Gad Mugagi is, this is related to data and saying that how long it would take to collect this data in the African perspective? And how do you ensure for data integrity in the development of this uh, database? And the third question is from James Daniel. I think James is trying to really see the building prediction medals, what about trained by this data as a generic guide for broader identification of hotspots for high potential power generation? And James is saying that this can be mapped globally using this open data available. What do you say about it? Over to you, Jeff and uh, Robert. While you are addressing these questions, we'll be able to receive more questions from our distinguished participants. Over to you. Thank you. Jeff, I can tackle the middle question, which relates to data collection. I believe the questioner asked, how can they collect data in Africa? Well, actually, um, we're not proposing a massive data collection program. Quite a lot of data, an enormous amount of data, has been collected already by African governments, by um, uh, foreign uh, oil and gas companies, by multilateral um, aid agencies, um, by international organizations. Um, it's expensive to collect data, to hire an army of people to go out there and collect data again. Much of this data is already collected. The trouble is it's not organized. It's in different places. And somebody who knows about one set of data doesn't know about a related set of data that would be important to them if they only knew. 
So the prompt, the challenge for Africa is not to, not on the collection end. Much has been collected already, but on the organization end to take all of this data it was collected by different people at different times for different purposes, most importantly, using different standards and to somehow regularize that, decide which of those data are reliable and organize them into a database management system. But the data itself already exists in different formats and greater or lesser degrees of reliability. The challenge, it's, it's an integration problem. So it's an organization and integration problem, which is why I, a systems engineer, am on the job. It's not a problem of collecting the data. It's handling the data you have and organizing it so you can make correct decisions. Because again, getting back to an earlier slide, the locus of risk in a geothermal project is underground, um, both financially, the millions of dollars it takes to drill a hole, and even in the best run program, with the best drillers, the best crew, uh, the best equipment, working in a province that they're familiar with and understand, even then, the failure rate of drilling is one in six. If you don't have the best crew or are working in an unknown province, the failure rate could be as high as one in two. So it's reducing that risk with as much knowledge as possible reducing from a 50% chance of failure to a 17% chance of failure. You can do that with knowledge and the knowledge you get from an organized database. Um, Jeff, um, I'm going to ask questioner, the question number one about the connection between geothermal data and food security. Well, the only connection right. I can the only connection I can imagine is that in the course of doing a geothermal enterprise, you learn a lot about local geology, which affects soils. Um, perhaps the question should be rephased because I rephrased. Uh, I, don't. I think. Uh, uh... If I understand it correctly, uh, actually, um, normally nowadays, you know, geothermal can be used, as you know, beyond power generation, and we use oh, yes. it either in cascaded systems or as a low to medium temperature geothermal systems. We use yes. it for direct use application. Yes. So basically, uh, we use for climate smart agriculture and agri value chain. So I think Toby is uh, really uh, seeing that what will be the contribution of geothermal for this uh, purposes. Definitely the geothermal uh, is as heat extraction or from separated brine and also getting this from the low temperature boreholes. It can be used actually for climate smart agriculture or actually greenhouse vegetable farming, milk pasteurizing, and others. I think uh, the Meningai uh, geothermal field, what we have here in East Africa region, I think the USAID also has supported, and also the Iceland International Development Agency has supported in that. So there is a very good, very attractive model or demo that you can see that so significantly the geothermal can really contribute for Food security in this uh, aspects, and where uh, my organization UNEP through our geo program is also now in preparation to do the hybridize of geothermal with solar in this aspects. So I think this is the question of Tabi. 
uh, if I address it well, or maybe if Jeff can address it and then he can go to uh, the other uh, uh, just to questions. Otherwise, there are a number of questions coming that I'm going to raise. Jeff, over to you. If you have one to add. Well, I, the only thing I would add is that regardless of the intended use of your geothermal project, whether it's for electricity generation or if it's lower or medium temperature resources that would be used for direct use applications, the underlying principles that we've outlined here are important for any geothermal project. Yeah, that, uh, is, that is the identification of geothermal resources, whether they're low temperature, medium or high temperature, you still need to integrate, you know, many different types of data from different geoscientific fields to come up with a proper conceptual model on where to extract the heat from the subsurface, whether it's low temperature for direct use or medium to high temperature for binary cycle or, you know, steam plants. Thank you. I think that, that's, I think, uh, okay. So, uh, in this case, I think we have additional questions. Uh, one is from Ayele. He's just wondering, is there any data submission procedure as part of a regulatory framework? That's his concern. And Sony also uh, working in the IRENA costing team. And uh, she's saying, I wonder if geothermal project costing and capacity data is available in the resources mentioned by the your presenters. So they she really wants to know about the geothermal costing and capacity data if it's available in these resources. What do you say about it? Over um, to you. Yeah, I can answer the second question. I think what the question is is how much developing a system that we've discussed would cost and the length of time it would take. So I can tell you just from general best practices that a, a full, a fully developed geothermal data system may take anywhere from one to five years to develop and build to completeness. Um, the costs could be anywhere from a few hundred thousand to perhaps 1 million US dollars. Um, and you need a team in place to build the data management system. And the team will consist of geoscientists who serve as data custodians. So you would want uh, expert, you know, subject matter experts in all your geoscientific fields, geophysics, chemistry, geology. You would want licensing experts, drilling engineers. And then you would also need some members of the team who have, you know, IT or ICT experience, um, who are able to set up, um, you know, computers as servers or who, who know about cloud-based computing. Um, so that is the team you would need in place. Um, and as I said, it typically takes one to five years to develop a, a full system. So I hope that answers that question. And then the other question I think was on data collection procedures. Yeah, the data submission procedure, if that is as can be incorporated or in the regulatory framework. Robert? So Robert, do you, um, I have some thoughts. Do you have any thoughts on that question? No? I'm, okay. parsing, I'm parsing it. <laughs> okay. So uh, I would say the answer to that is absolutely yes. Um, data collection, data collection procedures are usually um, established in what we call data standards. Now, this is a document that will have um, policies, and procedures, policies and procedures on how specific data should be collected in the field and then how it should be reported to the regulatory agency. So most uh, mature geothermal jurisdictions have these standard documents in place for the collection of geologic data, chemistry data, geophysics, um, from licensing how, um, for example, how certain geographic data should be submitted in terms of GIS uh, formats. And all of this, all of these standards are what drive the design of your database and your data management system. So you, you would want to design the structure of your database and the tables within your database based on the standards which are in place for data collection and data reporting. Um, 
much of these standards uh, in the geothermal industry actually come from the oil and gas industry, which, as, as we all know, predates geothermal industry, usually by decades. And the oil and gas industry has, and the regulatory agencies which oversee oil and gas, have in place um, very structured uh, requirements and standards for the reporting of data. And much of these standards have uh, since been used by the geothermal industry for reporting requirements. And they help inform the design of your data management system and your database table. Thank you very much, Jeff, for this clarification. And I have another question from Teddy. And Teddy is wondering that looking at the greenhouse gas emissions as a result of power production, do we have data on emission through the fumaroles? What are some of the variables that add in those emissions rather than the enthalpy of the reservoir? Okay, so humanity, yes, we have data. Humanity's um, greenhouse gas emission for the entire human race is in the order of 40 gigatons, 40 billion tons per year of greenhouse gases. Um, about 80% of the climate change effect is due to carbon dioxide and 20% due to methane. Of humanity's total um, emission, perhaps one third of that is from the electricity uh, electric power sector, which is actually a fairly clean sector already, surprisingly. Um, <coughs> in the developed world, electricity generation is almost 60% decarbonized now. Uh, the really dirty sector is transportation, but we're, we're not here to talk about transportation these days. Now you ask data on emission through fumaroles. Um, I don't know specific fumaroles, but I know that a one major volcanic eruption will uh, release on the order of a gigaton of carbon dioxide uh, over the course of the eruption. So that a, a one large volcanic eruption will, will do that. That's only a fraction of what the human race emits. So the point of that is to show you that what the human race is doing now with its technological society and primary energy demand is of more significance in terms of carbon emission than natural sources of greenhouse gas emission from the ground by an order of magnitude at least. What we do is an order of magnitude greater than what nature is doing. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I think uh, it doesn't mean that you know this discussion will uh, stop here. I think uh, most of our participants will continuously uh, actually in a start interaction with you and getting more uh, information uh, about it. I think uh, this is really a, a very good uh, summary of the need for all of us to have this database management system. And we are really uh, very much grateful uh, for again for the uh, presenters, uh, Robert uh, and Jeff, for sharing this uh, very fast experience in this database management uh, in your country, elsewhere in the world, including where we are from East Africa. This is really value addition for us and giving us this information. And I'm sure all uh, industries and governments, decision makers and experts have got uh, a very good information from your experience. 
And uh, I learned that some of the uh, countries here in East Africa have already worked with you. They have been guided uh, by you when we were inviting the most of them that they mentioned to us that they're quite familiar about this. So we really want to see the outcome of all this uh, interaction in our region where they will be able really to enhance their exploration data and the risk also associated with the uh, exploration. And we uh, thank you all, all distinguished participants for being here with us for the last 90 minutes, listening and also interacting uh, with the presenters with uh, very good and prominent questions. I'm sure they have answered your question. If there are things which are not clear, kindly contact them. And uh, I think uh, we will share our partner, the USEA, uh, the East African Geothermal Partner, Eric, and Ryan yes. will contact you with our reading materials. I give the floor now to Derek to uh, really uh, just give a concluding remarks yes. and to say right. goodbye to you. Uh, yeah, okay. Derek, thank over you. to you. Yes, thank you very much, Mesra. And I just want to thank uh, Jeff and Robert for taking the time to uh, present to us today. Uh, I think we all learned a lot about the geothermal databases. Um, I also want to pr promote our next webinar in our geothermal industrial park webinar series. Uh, it will be on October um, 27th uh, at 9.30 a.m. Um, I will be sending out an uh, invitation to everyone that is on our mailing list. Uh, I just want to make everybody aware that that we are continuing with uh, at least a few more webinars uh, in our series. Again, I'd like to thank everybody for coming and I'd especially like to thank Jeff and Robert for taking the time to uh, uh, present their work with us today. So thank you, Mesret. Thank you, Derek. Uh, thank you all. Uh, we also want to uh, remind you to really uh, participate for the upcoming virtual AIDS African Reefs Geothermal Conference. We are happy to inform you that we will have also a virtual exhibition during this uh, program and also the virtual uh, four parallel short courses. It will be on second and third. And also we have from four to six uh, will be the main conference. Actually, I think for those of you from the East Africa region who wants a sponsorship, we have the form on the uh, website, kindly complete the form and send it to all organizing a committee. And for exhibitors and others, there is, I think, all information on the website, kindly register. And we are looking forward to seeing you all this, uh, you know, in that time and just have make it really a successful geothermal conference with your very uh, active uh, participation and contribution to the conference. So thank you very much for our presenters, participants, and our partner, East African Geothermal Program. And thank you and looking forward to seeing you all during the Arjo 8 conference in starting from 2nd of November and to 8th. And remember, we have also a pre-conference investment forum for Kenya geothermal sector, organized, you know, moderated by the Geothermal Association of Kenya. And you can see the details in our website and you are most welcome to come there and participate. Over to you and have a good evening. And above all, I want to thank also my team, Ryan and Dombi, you know him all. He is really the main driver of all these webinars. And my team, Moses Imbego, who are also very much, you know, in this. Derek, who always really looking forward to working with you all as a team and actually to see you at the Arjo C8. And thank you very much. Karibo. Bye-bye. To, uh, Asante. Bye, everyone. To, to the panelists, kindly just uh, tag along. We yeah. For, for wrap up. Thanks. Okay. Thank you.